So now we get to the end of the 1800s <clears throat> and we enter this new era. So the, the, the massive, massive figure here is Teddy Roosevelt, so the president. Um, uh, a pretty uh, crazy individual, right? Um, one of these people in history that uh, is far from perfect, but a pretty insane person. He would read a book a day as president. Um, he, uh, I can't remember how many languages he spoke. Um, when he would go to mosques in the Middle East, he would speak in Arabic to the, to the scholars. And I mean, just a, a, a amazing dude. He would swim almost every day in the, you know, this freezing cold river in Washington, D.C. because he thought, you know, that's what men should do. Um, uh, so just a, 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 a unique individual. So Roosevelt, uh, was a sickly boy as a young person and he had a lot of breathing problems and, and issues so essentially his parents sent him out west um well yeah westward we would call it uh, it's like the middle part of the country does the dakotas and that sort of that area but sent him out west to what we would now call like a dude ranch right to go out and get better and that doesn't always work but in his case it did he got better, his, his physical ailments improved, and he got this you know, big love of outdoor living. He was a huge hunter, um, he camped all the time, and just all, all that kind of stuff, and he really kept that, that notion, sort of like a man's man, as it were, uh, ideas with him. And he takes those um, along with him uh, into the, the presidency, basically. Um, the first thing in this era, the first important big federal thing, is the so-called Lacey Act. The Lacey Act was to regulate um, hunting of, and, and particularly over hunting of wildlife. So essentially these are the first really large-scale wildlife regulations in the U.S. And you see a picture here from 1899. There's a couple, couple guys here, and there's, I cut off this photo, but there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, like 13 deer just in front of them, right? So this idea was, hey, we need to maybe start to just not let people just slaughter everything they want uh, at any one time. The two big players here that are gonna, that are gonna uh, take up the mantle of Marsh, or, or ideas from Marsh, are Pinchot at the, at, the, at the federal level and, and the sort of popular conceptualization in society. Gifford Pinchot, who's gonna become our first founder of the US Forest Service, the first director of the US Forest Service. He really starts actively pitching this idea of so-called conservation, right? And he's, he represents the utilitarian wing of, of conservation thinking. We gotta not chop down all those trees in the forest because we might need those trees in the future. Then there's John Muir, pictured here in the lower right, standing with President Roosevelt in Yosemite Valley on, on the promontory there. Uh, John Muir is a Scottish immigrant who is in the middle part of the country doing some stuff, doing, doing his due, and is working on a lathe, has a problem, the lathe screws up, throws some stuff in his eyes, and he thinks he's blinded. So he lays down on his bed with bandages on his eyes, and the you know, priests come, and all this kind of stuff, and he's like, oh my God, I'm gonna be blind the rest of my life. How am I gonna make, how am I, gonna make a living? So he prays to God, he says, God, please, you know, if, you, if you give me my sight back, I'll change my life, I'll do whatever. Long story short, he has this miraculous recovery. When they take the bandages off, he can see. And he says, okay, I'm done. I'm going west. And he just busts out to the west. And he eventually gets to California and the Sierras and is just awed by what he sees. <clears throat> now, in, in recent years, there's been a lot of criticism of Muir because he's seeing these landscapes that were depeopled, 
right? That the native peoples were, were eliminated, were, weren't there. And he's a massive proponent of wilderness, the value of wilderness, right? The people-less or the, or the rarely peopled landscapes. And so there's, there's all kinds of, um, of rethinking of uh, Muir. But what's, what you, but what's fundamentally important is he drove the, our conservation movement. And, and, and we cannot underestimate the power that he had. He both saw beauty in nature, but he also importantly wrote about nature. And even though we had you know, rail, rail and stuff of that nature, he realized that most people were never, ever, 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 ever in their lives going to be able to travel to Yosemite. So he started crafting really beautiful narratives. So he was a fantastic writer. So he would write newspapers, stories, magazine articles, books that would, that would, trans, that would go back east to the population centers and people would see the beauty of forests and mountain vistas and this and that. And so he really generated, he started the modern environmental activism movement, right, as we now think of it as this big organization that has membership that isn't necessarily in the area of so, so the classic would be Tahoe Blue. I don't know how many keep Tahoe, Tahoe Blue bumper stickers I see. We don't live near Lake Tahoe, right? We're really far away. Keep Tahoe Blue is an environmental organization built around improving water quality and stuff of that nature in Lake Tahoe. Something like 95% of their membership are people that live away from Lake Tahoe, right? That idea was, was, was inaugurated by John Muir. So he basically... Uh, forms a group that we now know as the Sierra Club and, and to, to, to lobby for the um, protection of these spaces. You and I get some, a good chunk of our water from not here, right? Here in Ventura County, we get some of our water from, depends on where we're talking about, but, but you know, some of our water, about a third-ish from groundwater resources, local water. We get... Um, uh, a good chunk, depending on where we are in the county, from the Colorado River uh, aqueduct. Depending on where we are, we can get another chunk from um, the Eastern Sierras, Owens Valley. And most of us get state water project water brought in from the no northern parts of Northern California when there's water, when it rains. All these projects are started in this era. And so <clears throat> the city of San Francisco says, hey, we want, a, we want guaranteed, we're you know, a growing city, we want a guaranteed water source, and they look to the Sierras. Sierras are high, so we can take that water and the gravity head, the, the pressure, just the gravity itself will push the water down, even though we're really far away from the Sierras, that water will, will come flowing down to us, so that sounds good. Oh, by the way, here's this place, Yosemite Valley. That's, that, it's all granite, right, it's hard, hard rock. Let's just put a dam at the bottom of that valley and we'll call it good and we'll flood it because we, we like water. And John Muir was appalled. He said, what are you talking about? You cannot destroy this valley. And so the Sierra Club starts to engage in legal challenges to the city of San Francisco for their attempt to take this uh, state and then national park and turn it into a, a, a reservoir. Huge battle, huge battle, huge battle. Long story short, the Sierra Club ultimately prevails. And we only have Yosemite Valley still because of the, the activism of the Sierra Club. City of San Francisco says, okay, screw you. So they go over to the, a next door valley called Hetch Hetchy Valley, which John Muir said was a second Yosemite. Also very beautiful, incredible, awesome plants and animals and everything. And the city of San Francisco wins that battle. So the city of San Francisco is allowed to dam Hetch Hetchy by putting in the Hetch Hetchy Dam and creating the Hetch Hetchy Reservoir. And that's where the city of San Francisco to this day gets its water. Um, and, and, you know, the lore is that losing that second battle broke John Muir's heart and then he died, he died shortly uh, thereafter. But the Sierra Club gets going, and that's a massive, powerful force um, uh, for a new type of engagement with conservation regulations and things. 
Also in this era, 1905, the U.S. Forest Service is established. As I mentioned, mentioned Gifford Pinchot is, becomes the head. When we drive into Los Padres here, do you guys, what does the sign say when we drive up to it? Right, land of many uses. So unlike the Park Service, which is we're going to set aside this stuff to preserve it, we're setting aside the, the forest uh, lands so that we can better use them, right? Better use them. Um, 1916 is our first international environmental regulation. It's a treaty we make with Canada, um, the Migratory Bird Treaty, that says that, hey, if some of these, the recognition was that, hey, just because, so maybe we can do this national park thing. Maybe we'll put this little island, we'll protect this little island. But if these are migratory organisms that live only part-time on our island, and then the rest of their time is somewhere else, it doesn't matter if we only save this little island. If we're not protecting them across their, their range, somebody's going to blow them away with a shotgun or something. And then what's the point, right? So, the, so this, this first law trying to think of that, let's think of the entirety of the life cycle of these critters, the entirety of their behavior, and make sure that we're taking steps that won't be undermined by any one, uh, you know, the weakest link in the chain, as it were. Uh, and I've had people... To uh, also in a previous conservation project, um, working to get rid of non-native invasive plants. I've had someone uh, try to sue me saying I was violating the Migratory Bird Act, um, which we can talk about when we get to that, when we talk about invasive species, which was the technical term is bullshit, but, um, but in any event, uh, uh, it's a very powerful law to this day. Um, okay, and then this era is gonna end with the Dust Bowl. So the Dust Bowl, is the, despite, I mean, we, we talk about Deepwater Horizon, which was a massive problem, uh, all these things, the drought in the Western U.S., massive problem. The biggest environmental disaster to date in our country's history was the Dust Bowl, right? And we don't really think about it that much anymore these days. But this is essentially um, the conversion of native grasslands, prairie. We till it with horrible dumbass practices that came from Europe that did not belong here, that do not belong here. This tillage just changes the soil horizon, kills plants, all this kind of bad stuff. And then um, uh, bad soil management practices. You'll find we talk to good farmers, good farmers talk about growing good soil, having good organic matrices, et cetera. But back then, people didn't necessarily appreciate that, didn't necessarily understand that. And then we got into a big drought, you know, a big sort of lack of water, and all this stuff led to these massive scale um, windstorms that would just decimate whole areas. So the Grapes of Wrath were written about this, right? The, the term Okies is the term we use for people from Oklahoma and Arkansas and these things that would come to California, Central Valley to, to work in our fields when their fields. So the massive, massively uh, important thing in our society. Suffice it to say, uh, this leads to the creation of the Soil Conservation Service, which is now part of the USDA, as a way to start to combat this, to, to combat soil erosion and stop these massive dirt storms that would just blow across the, the country. This era now that we're in, this era, we can, we can talk about it. The dominant theme is restrictions on what we do. So the common theme throughout all this stuff is, hey, we're beginning to not allow us to do whatever the heck we want. So hunting seasons would be the classic example, right? So you can't just willy-nilly let everybody, I'm going to murk and do whatever. Like we, we have to behave within certain norms, and, and the burgeoning conservation movement is going to help define what those norms should be. Questions? Okay. Then we get to the era of the so-called resource management era, which is really where our modern, our, the modern quantitative thinking about conservation really gets going. This is when we start to have programs in universities about this, people actively writing you know, lots of treatises about this, et cetera. The classic person here in this, in this era would be Aldo Leopold, who we've already mentioned. He, amongst other things, he talks about wildlife. When he says wildlife, he means game, which is the term we use for shooting things that we're going to eat, and non-game. He sort of has them all together in one big bin called wildlife, which we didn't really talk about 
uh, before then. So he writes uh, an influential uh, uh, a book in 1933 called Game Management, right? Which is about uh, how we make sure, you know, initially it's about deer and, 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 and rabbits and things of that nature. But very quickly, his, his thinking deepens, and eventually he produces his classic text, which is a Sand County Almanac, which is his reminiscences about a bunch of stuff. I have, if you've not read it in the optional reading, I have it, I have uh, in, our, in this week's reading. If you've already read it for another class, you have to reread it. But, but it's just a small excerpt about um, uh, the classic one where he talks about witnessing the green fire dying in the eyes of a wolf that he, he shot, right? So he starts off, his, so his, his, his past starts with, hey, I'm a, I'm a you know, game warden. I'm a guy out here, and my charge is to make sure there's lots of game, make sure there's lots of huntable food. And wolf, predator, bad, right? Mountain lion, bad. Coyote, bad. Bear, bad, right? And so he saw his job is to go blast away the predators because the predators might want to eat our food too, and we want to eat it. And so he basically, the story he recounts is he shoots this one female wolf and he goes up to her and he sees her dying and he basically says, what the, what the hell am I doing? Is this the right thing? Um, also realizes that once they depopulate the predatory community, the deer go apeshit is the technical term. The deer go incredibly crazy and they become super abundant. And those deer overgraze the, the area because there's so many of them, they're, they're just eating, 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 and then that causes erosion and all kinds of, so he realizes, you know, really this is a system. And us whacking these predators, us whacking or changing one part of this system has all kinds of other consequences. So maybe we need to think more about uh, 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 these systems, right? So that, 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 that's his thinking sort of in a, in a brief nutshell. Also in this era, we see the growing influence of the federal government in all aspects of life. This is, we're coming out, we, the 1928 is the Great Depression, right? Campus was built because of this, right? We built campus, one, because we needed a mental hospital, sure, but we also needed to employ people. So this campus, 5,000 people, three years, people were employed to build our campus, right? All the stuff we talked about last, you know, before about what are we doing, it was all to keep folks, well not, not all, but, but, a, but a key aspect was to keep folks employed. And so the classic uh, part of this is also uh, uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, the president, who, who believed in these, these types of programs. Examples of this in terms of major things that influence our conservation thinking. The Tennessee Valley Authority, which would become fundamental to our conversation about endangered species when we get to that conversation. But the, the Tennessee Valley Authority is an, is an is referring to this area in and around Tennessee, very, very poor, very, very poor folks. No electricity, no indoor plumbing, et cetera. And the idea was, hey, we're gonna build some, we're gonna install some hydroelectric power plants here that one will minimize flooding, which supposedly is a good thing. It's not in these contexts, but whatever, at the time we thought it was. Uh, and we'll give people drinkable water and create people they can recreate and go fishing on lakes and give them cheap, affordable electricity, right? Another example of that also is, is, are the dams, the dams that are now dying along the Colorado River because of this new era that we've entered. But, um, but the damming of the Western Rivers was a massive, insane project. I mean, engineering marvel for the ages, uh, even though the ecological damage was insane. But, but, um, but all that is this era, this era of the feds having lots more power and being really aggressive in terms of interacting with biological resources. In 1933, we have the first so-called cooperative research, wild, uh, first, wild, yeah, first cooperative wildlife research units. And this was, uh, uh, we still have sort of the, the, the remnants of these things, but really this was a, an interlude between the old school way of guys 
saying, oh, let's do this over here. And then the modern academic thinking of conservation planning and resource management. And it was this, this, this first attempt. This thing has sort of bridged these two eras that led to a lot of uh, useful insights that people um, started deploying. And then we start seeing things like the Pittman-Robertson Act, was the, which was the first really big allocation of federal dollars for the recovery of wildlife, for the restoration of degraded populations. 1941 to 1945, World War II, massive impact across the planet. Bombings, destruction of people, of ecosystems, everything is crazy. But it also led to um, less focus on people doing stuff here. So, so in some respects, things like fisheries and stuff, we get it, the resource gets a break while humans are slaughtering each other in some cases. And then I end this era with Joe Connell, one of my old professors, um, who essentially writes up um, his paper and, and really that's the birth of modern quantitative ecology, which is fundamental to, to conservation biology today. And so again, this was the barnacle story, the bar balanced thalamus competition. But importantly, it was also this idea of measuring things and using statistics in a rigorous way to compare is A different from B in an ecological sense. And so this era, this resource management era, is dominated by increasing scientific uh, uh, capacity and scientific training and, and understanding and more and more research trying to figure out the relationships between critters and organisms and management techniques and all that kind of stuff. And, 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 and this really births our, our academic thinking about um, conservation. Cool, any questions about that stuff? Okay, then we get on to the, um, the, the birth of the modern environmental movement. And this, is, and this is people get really upset. So people are really scared and worried and they're like, what the heck's going on here? And so the classic thing here would be Rachel Carson's, the classic text here would be Rachel Carson's Silent Spring which, as we've already talked about, is um, uh, basically what we now refer to as the ecotoxicology of, of DDT. DDT uh, first uh, uh, produced wide, you know, widespread use, 19, late 1930s. And a great example of unintended consequences. No one was thinking so, so the idea of DDT was that it was something that wasn't as bad as other things to deal with in, uh, annoying insects. So the idea was to try to make something less harmful, less impactful. Unfortunately, it was not without impacts, right? But it had hard to see impacts. It had unintended consequences. So this was, this was like, hey, we're gonna fight malaria hey, we're gonna fight pests on crops, this is gonna lead to less food waste, right? The thought was all these good things. Um, we, we come to understand, when Rachel Carson writes this in, in, in the 50s and 60s, that, oh my gosh, DDT is leading to population collapse of, of various species, including a lot of different birds, especially seabirds. So that's bad. So that, that, that's what, Silent Spring is about, that's what leads to the banning of DDT, at least in the US. We would still make it and send it around the world, but at least in the US we banned it initially. Um, but then it would take even longer, another 20, 30 years for us to really understand some of the other consequences. The first consequence is eggshell thinning. So mom's sitting on an egg, her weight crushes the egg and there's no baby born and so there's no babies in the population. But is anybody in uh, coastal contaminants right now? Nobody's taking coastal contaminants right now? Okay. Um, so before you guys graduate, you should take our coastal contaminants class. Very good. Um, one of the things we start learning in the 80s and 90s is that this is still going on. This bad, the badness of DDT, yeah, it's still going on. So we first see this with um, lesbian gull colonies. So in some of our offshore bird colonies, researchers are looking in the 80s, 
in their 70s, 80s, and they're like, hey, okay, cool. Okay, we, we kind of got through the, the eggshell thinning part, right? And so, okay, you know, the population's hammered, went down, but hey, but they're, they're still around. Okay, cool, the birds are around. And they're like, why are there no babies being born? I don't get it. Why are there no babies being born? And they can't figure it out. Many of our gulls and, and similar species are, are um, not sexually dimorphic. So the male and female look the same. They don't, they don't have different male-female colorings. They don't have different sizes. So if you look at a, a, a male western gull and a female western gull, it, it, it's like they look the same, right? And so what researchers figured out is like, why are they not having eggs? Why are they not having, why, why are they not, um, you know, giving birth? And so after looking at all these different things, they finally said, maybe we should just go sex them. And what they found is what you normally would have in a typical seabird colony, something like a one-to-one -one ratio, one male to one female, you know, on average. Maybe a little bit different here there, but basically that's it. What they were finding is these massively skewed populations. So almost all female. So, bur so, so gulls, so, so let me take it back, flying birds, are strongly influenced by gravity, right? It's hard to fly. So birds have very hollow bones, right? They're very light bones. And most bir birds only have one gonad. So they don't have two testes or two ovaries. They have one, and it tends to be in the middle of their belly. And so it's, it's, a, it's, it's interpreted as a, a weight-saving thing when they're trying to fly, right? Well, we what, these, what these researchers started to find was that, in fact, instead of a male and female pair, a mate on a, on a nest, it was a female-female pair. So they weren't, they weren't having eggs because they, it wasn't possible for those two to have eggs, right? But they were behaving as if they were mated, right? And so when people started doing autopsies, necropsies of these birds, what we would find is there would be two ovaries instead of one ovary. Or there might be a testy and an ovary. And so what we now know has happened is the birds that survived the initial poisoning of DDT, DDE, some of the secondary breakdown products are, are in the bloodstream, and if, and, but, they're, but they're the level they don't screw with the, with the eggshell protein, right? So the eggs still lay, but you still have that. And so this births the modern field of so-called endocrine disruptors. Or, and so what's happening is um, we, uh, um, when uh, we're used to toxicology, you and I are used to toxicology by saying, oh my gosh, if I give you a little bit of this lead, you're going to get a little bit sick. And if I give you a little bit more lead, you're going to get a little more sick. And a little more lead, you're going to get more sick, right? And so th that's how we do so-called dose response. But what we could actually couldn't understand before the 80s because we didn't have the technology to measure it. A lot of these substances were, are at the parts per billion concentration. So our, our chemistry was so non-precise, we couldn't even detect it. It was there. It was below our detect, detection limits in most cases. So we finally figured out that we have this, we were able to sense this, and we started looking. And a long story short, what's happening is, in the developing embryo, in the little, in the um, cells as they're developing and they turn into a, a, a juvenile, we have this massive orchestra, this massive dance of hormones that help us grow a finger and grow hair and, 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 and develop our heart and do all that kind of stuff they do, right? It's not just that we have these things, but it's when these things are expressed. So it's not that we have these systems, but when these systems flick on, flick off. And turns out what's happening is that, that, that DD, the secondary metabolites of DDT are very similar chemically to estrogen. So they're very similar to our feminizing molecules. And so as the, as the young individual is growing up, they're essentially getting bathed in these compounds and they're, they're being feminized. And so that leads to all kinds of issues. And so, um, so, and, it, and, and it, it's still very, very difficult to study. If you and I are studying the toxicity of lead or a pesticide or whatever, we'd go in there and we'd get 100, 100 rabbit cells or something, right? And we'd give it like different doses and we'd look at the effect. Or we'd get 100 rabbits or 100 mice and we'd do it and we'd get the effect, right? 
what's happening here with this, with this science that we really start to understand, just barely start to understand the 60s, really more the 80s, is I can take that concentration, that, that very small concentration, this endocrine disruptor, and it functions very different than all our whole human history of understanding how toxins and poisons work. So I can take this very small, you know, parts per billion possibly dose of this stuff and give it to the baby rabbit at day 12, no impact. And give it to the baby rabbit on day 13, no impact. Give it to the baby rabbit on day 14, massive impact, total change. Give it to the baby rabbit on day 15, no impact. 16, no impact. So it's, it's, it's very, very difficult we start to see the consequences of these unintended impacts in the 60s in a big way. Um, uh, in response, we have the Wilderness Act, we've already mentioned, that basically sets aside de facto legal, legal, uh, 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 wilder I should say not de facto, legal wilderness, meaning capital W, wilderness with a capital W, the legally defined wilderness, um, is a place where you can't have mechanized equipment and things of that nature. We create that because we see value in humans being able to go to places where there isn't a human footprint. Um, in the late 60s, Paul Ehrlich, my old postdoc advisor, um, um, writes The Population Bomb. He's part of this new wave of so-called neo-Malthusian thinking. Right, Tom uh, 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 Malthus, uh, ages ago basically says, hey, so um, resources grow at a certain rate, in his case, food, right, food grows at a certain rate, but populations can reproduce faster than that. So while a lot of our resources tend to increase linearly, um, the potential of a biological population to explode can be exponential. So we can rapidly outstrip the, the resources that we need and he argued that that leads to suffering. And that, if, and that if left to its own devices, that's famine, war, poverty, disease, all this kind of horrible stuff. And so we should take an active role in not, in, in, in not getting to that point. So the Ehrlich group sort of revisit that and say, hey, there's too many people on the planet. We got to do some different stuff. He, amongst other, other things, invents the, the IPAT and, and, and its descending organization, organ, um, equations which is a conceptual way to think about environmental science and conservation biology, uh, things like sustainability. And so, does anybody remember this from the intro textbook? Anyone? So the I stands for impact. So it's I-P-A-T. Um, I is impact. P is population or how many things are there. A is affluence, the intensity with which the resources are being used. And T is technology, so different technologies we can apply. I mean, it, 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 you get much more sophisticated, but that's the basic idea. The idea is, hey, we can understand our impact by understanding some of these drivers. Um, and, and that book, the 1968 Population Mark, massive bestseller. Massive, 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 massive bestseller. Another example of, in today's day, it's hard for us to under, really understand that, but it was like, he, I think Paul was on Johnny Carson's show like 18 times or something, right? A scientist on the John, on like a Tonight Show thing, like that's, that rarely if ever happens, right? Certainly not invited back. Um, so, so hugely impactful. The same era, Garrett Hardin um, uh, writes The Tragedy of the Commons um, about this notion of when, when we just have and it's just, can somebody remind me of what the tragedy of the commons is? Um, it's how, like, when the resource is kind of managed centrally by the government, uh -huh. and you use it freely, it tends to be a free, and we start to abuse it in an unintended Right, right, right. So the, the idea is based on, like, old English countryside, and we, we actually had a thing called the commons, which was an area that nobody owned but everybody could use to graze their sheep or, or what have you. And the argument was that if everybody gets the best, if I have my sheep in here and that sheep grazes a bunch of, eats a bunch of grass, then I can go take my sheep and sell it. And when I sell the sheep, I get all the benefit. Like I, I get all the profit or all the food or all the whatever from it, right? But if I have my sheep eat a little too much grass so it kind of screws the grass for everybody else, 
that hurts me a little bit, but it hurts all of us. So, so the, the impact is borne by everyone, but I get 100% of the benefit. And so, so this idea that if we're not careful, that, that approach to stuff can lead to these, uh, you know, um, really messed up incentives. And so that, that's the tragedy of the commons comes up in 1968. So that's also very powerful in terms of people's thinking. And then we have 1969, massively impactful year. So we on the West Coast say, oh, the Santa Barbara oil spill gave birth to the modern environmental movement because we're California. So we think everything revolves around us, right? And it was very, very important, very, very impactful, incredibly impactful. But there was a similar thing happening in Ohio in the Cuyahoga River where the river was catching fire. And people, uh, after like the fifth time that the river caught on fire, the river, the water, people say, you know, I don't think water is supposed to burn. And that was from all the waste that was coming out of these, these plants, industrial plants along the, the river. In the case of the uh, Santa Barbara oil spill, this is where all the media, mo this is where all the hot people hang out, right? This is where all the TikTokers go, right? Importantly, the power players at the time, Hollywood, television, film, movie, that's where they all go to vacation or hang out or live or whatever, right? And so this oil spill starts happening and starts washing up ashore and everybody's saying, oh, it's fine, we'll clean it up. And they clean it up and the next day more oil washes ashore and then more oil washes ashore and then more oil washes ashore. And people are like, what the heck's going on, right? We shouldn't have our beaches covered in oil. We shouldn't have the rivers burning. And so this really, these events really are fantastically important in terms of the public consciousness thinking that we have to do something differently. In the immediate wake of that, we have the first Earth Day, which is, you know, April 22nd each year, which is, as you guys all know, is like a celebration of nature and the Earth and all this kind of stuff. And, um, and really helps, again, solidify this broad-based public interest in doing something differently. So this era is dominated by fear and anger and this idea that technology is, is a threat, absolutely, the oil spills and the, and the plants and the DDT, but also technology might be a help. Maybe the technology could be a way to help us get out of this issue. So fear and anger are the big dominating things here. Um, also in this era, we get to some of these, some of these more active, what we consider conservation measures. One of the most important things early on, 1971, that thing on the, uh, that airplane right there called the SST or the supersonic transport. So this was, uh, you guys might have heard of the Concorde, which was, which was one of these versions of these planes that was built. Um, the US is the funder of all this aviation's innovation and figuring out how to make new airplane engines and all this and that. And so in the 60s, people started to say, hey, we can do this, this supersonic commercial flight, right? So we can go from, instead of going from the, you know, whatever, California, LA to New York in five hours or whatever it is, or four hours or whatever it is, we can get there in like an hour and a half, right? And, and all that kind of stuff. And so this is gonna be great. It's gonna revolutionize, uh, again, revolutionize public transportation, all this and that. But then people say, hey, this thing is going to fly. So on these planes, when you fly and you look out the window, you see the curvature of the Earth because they fly very high. They're not space planes, but they're very high. Um, but some people start to say, whoa, 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 all this unintended consequences stuff? Maybe that's what's going on here. And so um, it's unintended consequences that's going on. So, so you know what? I think. Um, I think maybe we shouldn't do this. So this is the first time in our history we do not go forward in the US. We do not go forward with the technology, not because it will harm the environment, because it might harm the environment. We didn't have, we didn't have the info yet. We didn't have the data wasn't in. Turns out it doesn't. It, it wouldn't have. But we didn't know that at the time. And so this is an example of taking the so-called precautionary principle. This is unusual, right? This is unusual. This normally doesn't happen. Um, 
and this, so this was a watershed event. Like, why wouldn't you, you know, the engineers couldn't believe it. Like, what? What do you mean you're not going to give us money to study this? Like, well, it might cause a problem. What do you mean it might cause a problem? In the past, we'd never thought of that. In the past, it was always, go ahead and make Facebook. What could possibly go wrong? <laughs> go ahead and make this thing. What could possibly, this was like, hey, yo, we read Frankenstein. Maybe there's some bad, maybe there's some downsides about this technology. Let's step back from the brink here. Okay. So super important. Next, in this era, you might also have heard this referred to as the golden age of environmental laws. So this is when most of our foundational, powerful environmental laws come into play. Classically, the Endangered Species Act, which we'll talk more about later, but the 1973's Federal Endangered Species Act goes into effect. The Environmental Protection Agency is established. By who? By Dick Nixon. Maybe not the biggest environmentalist ever, but was looking for a win, right? Was looking for a win. These things, EPA, Endangered Species Act, pass almost unanimous, either unanimously or almost unanimously. I'll say that again these measures passing Congress with massive bipartisan support. Massive, and not, not just kind of support, but almost everybody's like, of course we shouldn't shoot the last bald eagle. Like, who would vote against that? Um, also, the 70s, the, 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 a classic, the, the classic environmental campaign would be the Save the Whales campaign, right? So, uh, over-harvesting whales, driving them to extinction, all that kind of stuff. The slogan was simply, save the whales. It wasn't save the whales with seven hours of academic lectures from somebody by me. It was just like, save the whales, right? And so people are like, yeah, we should save the whales, man. Uh, also, in the mid-70s, we have the energy crisis which is another thing that you guys probably have, don't have a lot of memory about or, or even knowledge about. This was huge. So this was OPEC, right? The consortium of oil uh, uh, producing and exporting countries. Uh, basically said, you know what? And so this has to do with, with wars in the Middle East and all this and that. But they pretty much said, you know what? We think we're going to turn the tap off for a little bit. And so because we, we, the U.S., are importing most of our oil from places like the Middle East, from this, the, the, these oil exporting countries, it causes huge problems to the point where you can't get gas, whenever you, gas in your car whenever you want. So when I was a kid and you wanted to get gas, you had to look on your license plate. And it depended on, on the letter or the number at the end of your license plate whether you could go on a Monday or a, t a Tuesday. Right? what day of the week you could go gas up your vehicle. Um, and so long lines, so lines like down around the block to get gas, uh, uh, commonly. Um, uh, so we have the oil embargo. Okay, first it's like, oh my God, we don't have gas anymore. Then we have Three Mile Island, the, the nuclear accident um, that came out right after a movie that probably wouldn't have done so well called the, uh, 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 starring uh, Jane Fonda came out about a fictional nuclear power plant that screws up and has a near meltdown. So we had this Hollywood idea of, of this craziness. People are like, oh yeah, this is like science fiction. And then it happens in real life. People are like, oh my God. So we can't trust our oil. I, this nuclear stuff looks super sketch and dangerous. Oh my God, I don't know about that. And in fact, the, we cannot underestimate the impact of Three Mile Island has impacted nuclear power to this day. It's, it's the thing that's killed nuclear power. That, I mean, there's, there's other things going on, but that one event massively changed the course of nuclear power across the planet. Uh, and then also in 79, we have the Iranian Revolution, which basically closes off the Iranian taps. And so, so this era of, wait a second, we don't just have on-demand energy anymore. We have to do something different. 
Also in the late 70s, we have Love Canal, a big toxic, uh, toxic waste event, basically, that, that people were getting sick and, and dying um, from the legacy of old industrial pollution. Uh, in 1980, we have the Ehrlich-Simon bet. So this is Paul Ehrlich of, of our previous slides, fame. And uh, he bet with this famous economist uh, that over the coming years, uh, how, how much would these commodities cost? And so, so uh, gold and, and all these various things. And Ehrlich said, oh my God, we're so overpopulating the planet. We're going to have feast and famine. And, and we're having all these problems, not feast, we're going to have famine, and all these problems, and oh my God, everything's going to get more expensive. And the economist said, dude, you're high. And so Paul, who has uh, a bit of an ego, I'll just say that, uh, was like, oh, I'll take that bet. Long story short, Paul lost. Ehrlich lost. So Simon won. At the end of their bet, and they bet a symbolic, I forget what it was, like a hundred dollars or something, I can't remember what the symbolic bet was. But um, the important thing is every single economist you ever talk to will have heard of the Ehrlich-Simon bet. Most of you guys probably hadn't heard of it. They all hear it. And what they hear? Ah, this notion of scarcity of resources, worrying about over, over extraction, that's a myth. The, the, the conservationists are always sounding the alarm. They're never correct. And that was the takeaway. Ehrlich would go on to say, I bet the wrong things. I should have bet uh, po child poverty and all these other things, but, but regardless, he did, and that harmed um, um, conservation movement in many circles. Um, okay, then in 1980, we also have ANWR, the creation of ANWR, the Alaskan National Wildlife Refuge. That's what I'm showing here on this, on this map. This is a huge chunk of a huge state, and the idea here is we're going to establish an, uh, a refuge, and we're not going to extract oil and gas from this area. Okay, this is near the Prudhoe Bay oil fields up here. We have a giant, right here, we have a giant pipeline going down uh, to the south coast, which eventually will, will uh, play a prominent role in the Exxon Valdez oil spill, but that's, that's a story for later. Um, so, so the idea here is let's set this aside. Massive caribou herds that, are, that the native peoples depend on and that have been depending on for millennia, um, all this and that. Um, and in particular, there's this one area, you write it as 1002 in your notes, but it's pronounced the 1002. And people say it, verbalize it, they, they call it the 1002 area. And that's where all this stuff is still, con people still want to desperately extract oil and gas in this area. And so this sets up this, this long standing battle between people that want to drill, 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 baby, drill. You might have heard somebody say that. And people say, no, we should not drill here. This is important to protect. And so this becomes an, an iconic um, thing that's being fought over for the years to come. And then we close out this area, close out in 1980 with Ronald Reagan. Um, and so he becomes president. Ronald Reagan hates the government. Ronald Reagan says the scariest words in the um, American language are when someone knocks on your door and says, I'm from the government and here to help. Does not want to, thinks that government is best when it's almost non-existent, except for the military. Want to have a big military. But other than that, everything should be small, supposedly, right? So this so-called Reagan era conservatism um, that, that rises to power. In particular, for our conversation, Ronald Reagan declares, I am a sagebrush rebel. That was insane until January 6th. Um, but it was it's the same rhetoric. So who were the sagebrush rebels? That's, I have the picture of Time Magazine on the lower right. Has, any, has anybody heard of the sagebrush rebels or sagebrush rebellion? OK. So the idea here is this is a mostly Western lands movement of mostly ranchers, farmers in the Western US. And they basically say, we should be able to do what we want on federal lands. We shouldn't have the federal government restricting us or telling us how to, how to do stuff. And so they started 
engaging in active craziness, uh, I would suggest, my personal opinion. That's the best personal opinion. Um, so they would do things like, we'd have a forest service road that was chained off, closed, say, hey, you can't go on it. They'd go and break down the, break down the gate, right? They would say, oh, you're not allowed to graze your cattle here? They'd go, I'm an American. Break open that gate and go graze their cattle there, right? So they were arguing that the government was evil, that the government was dictatorial, and being deeply unfair to them and restricting what they knew to be the best, what they thought was the best use of these resources. And so the, 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 the movement got to be termed um, the Sagebrush Rebellion. So these are folks that are actively, you know, breaking the law, squatting on land, doing all kinds of stuff. And here we have the President of the United States saying, hey, I'm with you guys, right? That was unprecedented. That was crazy. Totally different than Teddy Roosevelt, right? The opposite of Teddy Roosevelt. And so, so, so that, that's this era. Okay, now we're into the almost done. We're almost done. Now we're into the, um, uh, the next to last phase. So I'm, I'm putting this one from 1981 to 2005. 2005 Hurricane Katrina. I'm using that to mark stuff. Oh, sorry. This is off the, I don't know why my, my slide's a little bit off there. Sorry. On the bottom it says challenges, it should read, challenges to and revision of environmental laws is the big theme for this phase. Sorry about that. I wonder how that happened. Okay. So, okay, in this era, we've gone from the U.S. as like the focus of American conservation, all these laws, all these policies, we're going to fix the U.S., we're going to make things better. Now the attention turns more, even amongst Americans, to the global patterns of things. So let, let's figure out how these issues are going on. Can we uh, learn lessons from our colleagues? Can we impart our learnings to them? That kind of thing. Um, and so as that happens, and as the Reagan administration comes in at the federal level, we start to see this stagnation of conservation policy. We were pretty much on a, every couple of years, oh, let's do, solve this problem. Let's like work on this. Let's have a thing to address this. Let's have a, the Reagan administration gets in, they go, yeah, you know what? We're not going to do more environment stuff. Um, the, the first era is uh, the James Watt era. James Watt was the interior secretary for Ronald Reagan. Let's see, what do I say about James Watt? He was a, um, wasn't a big environmentalist, let's say that. So, um, Grand, has anybody been to the Grand Canyon? Pretty cool? You guys think it's pretty cool? You guys like to spend a couple days there? I like to spend a couple days there. It's pretty cool. James Watt, the Interior Secretary, the person charged with managing our nation's resources, um, they said, hey, we're going to take you on a, a rafting trip, like a, uh, I think it's like a five, five, six days, something like that, rafting trip down the Grand Canyon. Okay, cool. He's so bored by day three, he has a helicopter fly in and pick him up and pick him up on a sandbank and fly him back home. So that's the kind of person that was in charge of stewarding our resources. Not, not a friend of conservation. Um, he had a lieutenant named Gail Norton she would go on to become George W. Bush's interior secretary when he became president in 2000. And George W. Bush administration picks up with gusto from a lot of the folks from the Reagan administration. Um, the first George Bush administration also obviously continued many of Reagan's policies, but there was a bit of a moderating force there. Um, at least rhetorically, 
wetland protection, things of that nature were crafted in, in the, the first Bush. Second Bush, return to the Reagan era. Um, let, let, let's gut the agencies that work on conservation. Let's, let's make sure they don't have the ability to enact new policies, et cetera. Um, and so all this, all this together means that the new policies are very few and far between. Okay, um, the Society for Conservation Biology, the formal academic professional group that works on conservation biology, starts in this era. Great meeting, I would encourage you guys to think about going. They only, we only meet every other year. We don't, a lot of societies meet every year, they meet every other year. Good, good meeting. Um, also in this era, mid 80s, we have the Brundtland Report, which is the entity that gives us the term and the de modern definition of sustainability. So thinking of sustainable systems. Engaging in our economic practices, social practices, life practices in a way that doesn't degrade the ability to, for future generations to, to engage with that forest, fishery, whatever. Um, pretty much now, environmental issues are definitely mainstreamed, right? So, so they're, they're now totally in the popular consciousness. Such that in 1989, I have the cover of Time Magazine over here on the right, um, which I, I've, I've shown you a couple of Time Magazines. You guys probably don't. This, this was, this was a, a thing called a magazine. I know you guys don't have magazines. Uh, but it was very, very popular and everybody had it. You go to the barber shop, you go to the doctor's office, there's always a Time Magazine around. And they always produced the person of the year. They used to call it the man of the year, then it became the person of the year. And this year, 1989, it was the planet Earth, which was you know, a symbolic thing, I mean, a thing to sell magazines, but, but it's significant, right, that that was the, the thing that was highlighted on the cover. Um, and in 1990, a Gallup poll found that 76% of the American public self-identify as environmentalists, right? Now, were they all environmentalists like maybe some of us would think? Probably not. But the fact that even that many would say that even kind of I consider myself an environmentalist is a massive change, right? Is a massive improvement in terms of people, at least conceptually, thinking about how they relate to nature and conservation and things of that nature. In 1991, we have the first National People of Color Environmental Justice Summit in DC. So this is uh, one of the, the first things that really um, um, puts what we now call environmental justice in the foreground, right? It didn't, it didn't, it wasn't in the foreground then, but it started of getting these ideas that, that in addition to all these other concerns, we also need to think about the communities that bear a consistently bear a disproportionate brunt of the downsides of poor resource management. Pollution being the most obvious one, but there's m many, many dimensions to that. In this era, we're seeing decisions increasingly being international. So international agreements, multilateral agreements, we're doing more collaborative stuff uh, starting in the early 80s across the planet, right? So um, perhaps the, 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 one of the high points here is the Montreal Protocol. So a lot of you guys are super depressed about climate change, like, oh my God, the world's gonna end. I, I had a couple of those when I was a kid. One was nuclear war. We thought we were all gonna die. Nuclear. But as far as the environment, it was CFCs, chlorofluorocarbons. It was a massive exploding problem. Global commons, global atmosphere coming from, from chlorofluorocarbons, just like DDTs, were invented to be a non-problem thing. Were invented to avoid, avoid some of the downsides of the other substances. These are solvents, these are fire retardants. And these things are so inert, they're, they're such useful things, that they don't break down ever, or virtually ever. And so they so don't break down, they eventually get up in the air. And they so don't break down, they eventually get up into the upper atmosphere, the high stratosphere. And turns out when they get exposed to UV, the chlorine atoms break off 
and they scavenge our ozone, our naturally protective ozone layer. Ozone down here, you and I, bad. Hurts our lungs, causes pollution, makes LA look orange. Up in the high atmosphere, it's a shield to keep radi dangerous radiation that tweaks our DNA at bay. So we're not talking about the, the low down ozone, we're talking about the ozone high, high up in the atmosphere. And so it's, it's declining, it's declining. We have this so-called ozone hole, which isn't really a hole, it's just the thinning of the ozone layer, particularly around Antarctica because of the, the atmospheric chemistry around Antarctica. And so we're like, oh my God, there's nothing we can do. Countries, I know it sounds crazy, countries come together and the final agreement is, is fleshed out in Montreal, Canada, so that's why it's called the Montreal Protocol. Countries agree to voluntarily step back from using these substances and begin the phase out of these substances, even though we didn't have substitutes for all of them at that time. And now our ozone hole is beginning to recover. Just like climate change, it did not recover instantly. It's gonna take another 50 years for it to fully recover. But we got together and said, this, this thing is bad. Let's fix this, and we fixed it. Without somebody putting a gun to someone's head, without somebody threatening sanctions, it was adults got together and adults said, okay, let's figure out how to do this. Uh, and then also another a, a example of this with regards to fisheries would be the Georgia's Bank, the cod stocks, the cod that are one of the main reasons why people came to North America in the first place. This massive resource that was before we had refrigeration, which was incredibly important f food and you could salt it and you could preserve it. Cod was massive. We drove that fishery to almost complete extinction. And so the fish population got so low, this is off the New England coast, off the sort of southern Canada, northern, northern uh, US, um, uh, that we actually closed the bank to 100%. Nobody could, nobody could fish at all there in 1994. Huge controversy. That was a joint American-Canadian agreement. And then in 2000, well, actually, I'll skip that. That's probably why that one's there. Okay. So uh, in 2007, which should be in this one, I think I didn't fix that slide. Uh, in 2007, we've, we become, for the first time ever in our history, an urban species. Up, to, up before 2007, more humans lived outside of, hit, of cities than in cities for the entirety of our species history. Since 2007, more humans live in an urban environment than live outside an urban environment. And as we go forward, that's only gonna intensify. So a huge shift. Okay, so then we have 2005. 2005 is Hurricane Katrina, and I'm using that as a marker. So this very last era that we're in here, our last bit of history, is our modern era. So this is this era, so a lot of these trends started in the 80s, but, but they really picked up speed. 2006 onward, we're in this era of, of skepticism about science. Skepticism when someone says, this is bad for the environment, this is bad for a resource, people are like, are you sure? And again, we should all have skepticism. Yes, being a, a healthy skeptic is important, but um, I'm talking about insane skepticism. I'm talking about people that, that don't look at the facts, don't look at reality, and are not being a fair arbiter of the, the issues. It's rather a political tactic. Um, an increasing role of authoritarianism. And as someone that has worked in a country doing a lot of conservation, trying to do a lot of good, in an authoritarian dictatorship setting, it ain't, it ain't worth it. I don't work in Turkey anymore because of that. It's, it, it's, it, if you don't have democratic protections and checks and balances, uh, it ain't gonna work. It was great when I wanted to do my wetland restoration. I just asked someone, he gave me, a, he gave me an excavator and we just went and did it, didn't have to get permits. That was awesome. Love that part of it. But then when they decided they wanted to just rip it up and do their own thing, there's nothing to stop them. So authoritarianism is not good for conservation. It could be good for token conservation if you wanna be a, a man and show off your tiger and make maybe the, 
the dictator wants to have a tiger in his, in his palace, maybe it's good for those 10 tigers, but in aggregate for the conservation of nature, authoritarianism is bad, is very anti-conservation. Okay, so we're starting with 2006 also because this is starting the first year of 16 consecutive years since when we're seeing a net decline in the democratic measures of countries around the globe. So more countries are losing democratic institutions, freedoms, than are gaining them. So we're in this weird phase in our, in our world right now. We're also seeing in this, this, since 2005 onward, increasing examples of how non-resilient we are to disasters. So doesn't mean we can't be, but, but the systems as they existed, the preparations as they existed, we're seeing they're, they're not, they weren't ready as of 2006. So examples are the Haitian earthquake of 2010, which the initial earthquake kills at least about 100,000 people. We just had an earthquake in, in Turkey last night. The estimates are, I saw 2,000. It's going to get a lot higher. But, this is, but it's doubtful it's going to be like this level. Like, right? Haiti, massive devastation. Haiti is currently a failed state. There is no... There is no government in the country of Haiti right now. And while there, to be sure, there's all kinds of drivers there, it really, this modern crisis starts with the earthquake. The country never recovered, has never recovered. We can talk about the Deepwater Horizon, the BP oil spill, 2010 also. We spilled 4.9 million barrels of oil, and I would argue that there's essentially been no significant major policy change. This is the largest marine oil spill in U.S. history. It hasn't changed much. In fact, we're doing more oil drilling now than before that oil spill. 2011, the, the Fukushima disaster, the, the earthquake slash tsunami slash nuclear uh, power plant inundation and, and meltdown, still not repaired that, that, uh, that nuclear power plant and it won't be repaired for decades to come. We have Super Storm Sandy, Super Storm St Sandy that technically wasn't a, a hurricane, but basically acted like a hurricane and nuked uh, New, New Jersey and, and uh, New York and all that kind of stuff. So, so this era of like more and more of these disasters that are just massive and they're hard to recover from our existing institutions, our existing structures, our existing infrastructure, not ready to deal with this, with this thing. Throughout this era, we're seeing the norming of autocracy, increasing use of propaganda, particularly in the context of environmental concerns and conservation concerns. A large scale pullback from international agreements, including international conservation agreements. And in general, a decline in environmental protections, right? And so we see this most explicitly with the election of Trump in the US the election of Duterte in the Philippines and Bolsonaro in Brazil. Basically, I mean, there's, there's different specifics, but all of them, hey, let's gut the conservation protections. Let's defund these agencies. Let's, let's, let's eliminate the, the restrictions on whatever. Uh, if you go in the next room, uh, there's a painting that one of our trips to Louisiana, our, our students did, um, this refinery we've been go, driving by every year for 20 years normally has a little bit of a little bit of a flame coming out of it. That year, it was about a foot and a half long flame just looking outside the van, and it was because the Trump administration said, "Nope, you guys don't have to restrict your emissions from these these oil refineries." So immediately, these power plants or these refineries started. Whoosh. So so in very tangible ways and in very maybe hard to see ways. We've seen this um, with, with, these, um, with these administrations, um, not even the rhetoric of environmental protection, right? The rhetoric has all changed. Uh, and then also other highlights in this era, uh, uh, COP21 passed, right? The, the, the sort of new version of the Paris Accord. Um, we're, we're struggling to enact it, but, but that happened. Um, and then of course, big huge thing, the pandemic. Right? 
the pandemic. That everybody stayed home, radically changed. We still don't know what this is doing to us, right? We're still figuring this out. What's it doing to your guys' mental health? What it's doing to the economy? We're still figuring this out. But it was a major, major impact, right? Initially, the argument was, ah, oh, our climate, our emissions, we're go this is like great. It's reducing our carbon emissions and everything. It did a little bit, and now we're back on track to what we were before the pandemic. So. So it's unclear how the pandemic is going to play out long term in the context of conservation biology, but it is, it, it, it's, it's changed a bunch of stuff. How much and in what nature we'll have to see. For example, we'll be doing roadkill later. And uh, I, I thought that our road kill, or the roadkill would go down because there weren't, weren't, weren't as many people on the roads. Nope. Roadkill went down a little bit, went down by about a third. And that's it. So, so um, the COVID pandemic was a massive experiment done on the scale of our planet, and we're still trying to interpret those. But, but there is some lessons there. Um, one example, the cartoon on the right is just from the Trump administration. This is um, Secretary Zinke, who was installed as uh, you know again the head of the Interior Department, ties to our region. His wife was from. It, it, was from, is from, that's not, I don't think she died or anything. So is from Santa Barbara. So had a strong tie out here. Um, um, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you the story, not, not on this. Uh, I'm recording this, so I'll, I'll tell you the story after I turn off the recording. But, but I can tell you a story about <laughs> Zinke, Zinke and, and us. Um, so um, I'll just say, not maybe a super great protector of resources. Um, uh, and then, of course, now we're in this Russian invasion of Ukraine, right? Massive impacts, not only on like sort of falling on the pandemic, but another massive shock to energy and things and food systems around the world. So a lot of countries depend on the grain, like one third of the, the wheat comes out of the, that region of the, of the world. So massive, food insecurities, massive energy changes, right? So, so now everybody's trying to get off Russian oil, trying to get off all this. Can we get to solar faster? Can we get to wind and, and tidal faster, right? How that will play out, we don't know, but these are pandemic and Russian invasion, massive shocks that will have impacts on conservation stuff going forward. Okay, so the themes to wrap up these, these ideas here. Themes, since the, for the last two eras that we just talked about, since the 1980s, I would, I would characterize it as a conservation backlash. So we have three different levels here. We have the government, NGOs, and then just together. So in the government, we see increasing sophistication of anti-environmental arguments. Our laws are so powerful and we're so well-written, it's very difficult to dismantle the, uh, so now I'm talking again about the US. So we were talking a little bit about general trends. Now we're back to talking about the US, US conservation history. It's difficult to dismantle the Endangered Species Act, the Clean Water Act, these, these different governing um, legislations, particularly at the federal level. So the crowd that has been working since the 80s to undermine environmental protection and to work against effective conservation policy, um, has, has argued, um, has increased the sophistication of their arguments. Um, and so they include things like having um, political operatives in agencies and, and technical people are out. We see this with as various administrations come in in terms of interior, National Park Service, um, um, uh, uh, NOAA, all these types of places. So you get rid of the experts and you put in the, the politicos. Um, get rid of mandatory requirements and put in voluntary compliance. Um, a lot of very, very disingenuous focus on, we need quality science, we need peer review. Those are almost always in these last couple decades um, 
an excuse to delay action, an excuse to, to enforce a new level of mercury um, uh, you know, poisoning, um, that kind of stuff. And then, super, super importantly, you guys understand this, a massive defunding of the budgets. So you defund the budgets, and then the system doesn't work, and then everybody gets frustrated. The enviros, the business owners, the farmers, the ranchers, everybody's frustrated. I need this permit, I can't get the permit processed. And then people just start to say, you know what? The whole thing is broken. The whole thing is inept. The whole thing is bureaucratic. The whole thing is dysfunctional. We, gotta throw the, we just gotta throw everything out, right? That is by design, make no mistake. So, so um, yeah, de 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 decreasing budgets are a, a, a very popular way to counteract conservation, um, effective conservation. Uh, we do see some outright curtailing and elimination of regulations and laws. Um, uh, although I'd say that above ones are more common. And at the federal government, supposedly, there's an increasing interest in shifting decisions away from the federal government to local control, unless the local control people don't like. Then they say, no, what we really mean is we, we need more federal. So, so it, what, I've dis, what I've found over the last couple decades is when people say, we just need to have federal control, or we just need to have local control, they generally speaking don't believe that. They just want a different result than what they have. So these are couched in political philosophies and, and personal, personal beliefs, but really it's about um, a particular issue and wanting to get a more favorable audience, usually. In terms of the non-governmental organi organization world, what we've seen is a growing prominence of think tanks. Think tanks on the left, think tanks on the right. And so these are funded by big donors. These are um, you know, nonprofit organizations, so these aren't businesses, so they're, they're, you can just set them up, anybody can set one up. Mostly staffed by ideologues, very media savvy. So uh, I talk to the media a lot, like a lot, a lot. Um, I get a lot of flack for talking to the media a lot. So there's Many folks in academia, at least historically, as, as, as we were groomed for this, shouldn't talk to the media, right? Like, oh, the media, like, that's like, that's, you know, that's not being real science and all this and that, right? So there's a hesitancy amongst many academics to talk to the media, or they feel self-conscious, or they feel embarrassed, or they get nervous, like, oh my god, I can't talk to the media, right? Not the think tanks. The think tank folks are, are groomed to, to they're, they're crafted in most cases to talk to the media and to talk to elected representatives. So their whole point is to push messages into the public arena and do it very sophisticatedly. Beautiful graphics, well-written prose, you know, all that kind of stuff. So they've filled the gap where historically you might think a professor or an academic or a researcher from an agency would go in there. Um, these NGOs and these particularly these, these think tanks have really filled in the gap there. Um, and, and, and some of these anti-conservation NGOs are really about, you'll hear them talk about, we need sound science, which is a, a Q meaning um, uh, I want to delay and I want to study it longer and longer and, and, and figure out how we can uh, not have this be in place. Or they'll say, we need further study, which is again, I will always say, everybody always, always say we need to study it more, but, but these folks are designed to, th those arguments are designed to, to blunt effective enactment of policies and methods. And overall in this, in this era, in this era of conservation backlash, um, uh, people that are doing conservation are often painted as extremists, as crazy folks, as politically motivated, and as not of my community. These are the others. These are other folks. These are weirdos. These are from the university. These are from the city. These are from the other state. These are from DC. Um, and, and, and you can't trust them. They're not authentic. 
And, and then that's coupled with active disinformation lying campaigns. And, the, and that all depends, those things can only work if you have an ignorant population that doesn't understand the conservation goings on. But we said as of 2007, we're now mostly an urban species. So it's easier to trick people that know nothing about, that don't spend much time in the forest or don't spend much time out in the fields. It's easier to trick them with some of this rhetoric. And so, so to have effective conservation policy, people have to appreciate, or they don't have to, but it's helpful to have people appreciate, you know, have some, have some relationship with nature. The question, now that we've moved more to like uh, urban than rural, do you think that whole number that you mentioned earlier, the 76% is like drastically different now? Like drastically lower? Or uh, lower? It's a great question. We should look it up. I don't know. We could totally look it up. I, I would guess it would be lower. But we'll see. It's a good question. Other questions? OK. So the lessons, that, so, the, so that, that was the most, OK. So then uh, the sort of takeaways since we started this, since Thoreau's time, in general, we now see natural resources as public resources. They're no longer the king's, the king's ownership. It's, it's shared in community, right? We all benefit from this. We all have a responsibility in this, that, that kind of idea. Uh, individual leadership and public concern, mostly fear or anger, but, but those things can sometimes drive government action. So do not underestimate the power of getting people ticked off and people angry and motivated, right? It's easy with social media to get people ticked off and then have them sign some petition that no one will ever see and then think they're, they're doing something. But when done correctly, we can actually get new policies, new, new structures in place to be more protective of a particular issue or resource. The specific issues change. Is it, are they CFCs? Are they... Um, are they a phthalates? You know, you know, those kind of things. The specific issues change, but the underlying forces and views don't. And we talk about the motivation for a particular conservation effort, it's almost always going to be a utilitarian or an intrinsic argument, right? So the preservationists versus the utilitarianists. Um, so that, that, that theme remains. We've also seen since 1854 that conservation is less of an isolated concern. It's now increasingly tied up with other things like um, public health, like environmental justice, like um, mental well-being, all that kind of stuff. Um, so it's now seen as more of an integrative part of, of human activities. As we said before, the ultimate threats are how many humans are on the planet and how intensely they use their, their resources. Um, and we have all these things like the siren call of the short-term stuff. Um, but, but I'd say these are, these are the most generic conservation lessons that we've, that we've learned over, over that period. OK, so the last little bit here, we'll finish up with this last little bit. So here we go. Here's all the stuff. Just spent all this time talking all these dates. You guys are super bored. Like, oh my God, he gave us so many dates. I can't even think of it. When was, when was uh, Yellowstone? You guys? 1872. Thank you very much. Okay, so you all remember at least one day. That's good. I like that. Okay, that's good. That's good. That's, good. that's real, real good. Real good. Um, uh, when was the Santa Barbara oil spill? 1969. Thank you very much. Okay, good. All right, so, so here we go. So we, I gave you a bunch of dates laid out the conceptual underpinnings of modern conservation thinking, OK? Um, so hey, I should just be able to give this PowerPoint, and then people will, then we'll, won't have any problems, right? People go, oh, OK, I get it. Now we should, we should behave this way. Uh, no. So I'll give you one cautionary example to wrap us up. So theoretically, oh my gosh, I, you know, theoretically, you'd hope that I or you or someone would go into an area and we'd identify the problem, show people the problem. They'd go, oh my gosh, we've got to step back. We've got to do something different. Unfortunately, it's easier said than done. So my case in point here is the Republic of Nauru. So this is an island, a small island in the South Pacific. It's only about 21 square kilometers, so it's small. 
It's uh, near Australia, it's south of the Marshall Islands. It's one of only three naturally occurring so-called guano islands. I'm gonna actually turn the, all the lights out so you guys can see this, because uh, this is a little dark on the screen here. So um, uh, this is a map of the world, and all those, all those dots are essentially major uh, uh, phosphorus deposits where folks have been, where we mine phosphorus for industrial or for fertilizer uh, uh, purposes. Then you'll see these three little red things. One, wait, wait, wait. one here, one here, and one here. Those are guano islands. These are, these are, this is basically millennia of birds pooping. Seabirds coming, landing, you know, relieving themselves and then flying over or going to their nest. And then thousands and thousands of birds doing that every year for, for thousands and thousands and thousands of years leads to this buildup of ultra pure uh, phosphate, guano. And so initially, this little island, this, this, this uh, you know, peopled by Polynesians, um, uh, small island, hanging out, doing their do, it's all good. Uh, some Europeans cruise by, hey, what's up, how's it going, nice, okay, hi, whatever, trade for a bit of food or whatever. Um, uh, every once in a while, an escaped European prisoner will go, you know, take, take up residence there, but not, not a lot going on there. Then, in Australia, uh, late 1800s, this geologist looks and he sees this rock that's used to prop open the door of this, of this business. I can't remember the name of the business it was. And this dude was a scientist, he's a geologist, and he goes, well, that, that is, what's that? He said, oh, this is petrified wood from the island of Nauru. Actually, they called it, uh, uh, they call it Pleasant Island, the original name for the place. Um, he's like, petrified, that doesn't look like petrified uh, wood and went and looked at it and he found it wasn't petrified wood, it was pure phosphate. And he's like, oh my God, we can make some money. So then we have the, the um, uh, colonizers flow in in a big bad way and start to set up extraction. This really gets going with the Germans. So the Germans are the classic, you know, fantastic chemists, industrial chemists that can do all kinds of crazy chemical tricks. So they go in and they start intensive mining, um, uh, starting in, in 1905. And this is a very flat island. This is very small, very simple uh, uh, geomorphology, very, very flat. Um, within a couple years, the problems are starting to show up. So this is a quote from a National Geographic photographer that did a, did a photo spread and then wrote a little story in 1921. I'll just read it real quick. Uh, it says, uh, the quote is, a, a worked out phosphate field is a dismal, ghastly track of land with its thousands of upstanding white coral pinnacles from 10 to 30 feet high, its cavernous depths littered with broken coral, abandoned tram tracks, discarded phosphate baskets, and rusted American kerosene tins. So what's going on is the local people are living on the perimeter of the island. The interior, what they call it topside, the interior part in here was basically deemed, hey, let's start mining it. Let's start, let's start scraping it, right? And already, if you can't read this, already by 1921, the dark is essentially the, the you know, living area, the, the, the resident area um, of the, the colonizers, the, the industrialists. This light colored here around the perimeter is where the native peoples are living, right, right on the beach, basically. This area already, this, this dark hatch, already by 19, you know, with just a couple decades, is already done, is already no more. And then this area is actively being exploited. So already by 19, um, by the 19, uh, uh, you know, like, let's call it two decades or so afterwards, we're starting to see major scale transformation. This is what it looks like. So these are uh, Chinese laborers, and they're hand excavating all of this stuff. So they've cleared the forest tropical forest, and they're just digging up the ground. These things here are dead coral heads, extinct coral heads, and so that they don't want the coral, but the area in between all the coral heads is where all the guano has built up, and that's what they're excavating. So 
excavate, excavate, and, and, and a typical thing will happen, right? So it's imperial powers control it, um, uh, Germany controls it, World War I, it's taken over by uh, Australia, New Zealand, Great Britain, they're controlling it. World War II, the J Japanese come in, they take it over, uh, you know, and, and then end of World War II, it goes back to the sort of protectorate control um, uh, uh, by the essentially Australians. And it's still mining, whole time, mining, 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 mining. The Nauru people finally get a chance to vote for independence. They do in 1968. They become their own country. Say, we don't want to be part of, uh, you know, the UK or Australia or whatever. We want to be our own people. Okay, now they've been going, doing this for decades now. And they said, you know what? Let's keep mining. So, so no longer is it the imperial powers saying we should overexploit the resources. It's the local folks saying, well, let's well, yeah, that sounds like a good plan. We'll keep doing that. They put their money into a trust. And the idea is, yes, we understand there's a limited, there's a limited resource, but we're going to put this in the bank and just make a crap load of money, and then we'll live off that investment. Right? That's the bargain. The bargain is that, yeah, we'll destroy the environment, but we'll have money in the bank, so it'll be okay. Uh, by 1975, there, the trust, the phosphate trust, has, uh, in Australian dollars, a billion dollars in it. And they have the second largest per capita gross domestic product in the world. Only Saudi Arabia has a higher gross domestic product uh, 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 per person. So on paper, it looks like they're doing great. Uh, these guys would buy... Lamborghinis to, to, to drive on their, like the whole, like whatever it is, like 19 kilometers of roads, right? Like, like you know, it's, it's crazy. This is what it looks like now. Okay, this interior is basically all just dead, extinct coral. And the, the mining has removed all the soil, so it's not like it can be restored. It's not like all of a sudden it's gonna be, the soil's gonna come back and the trees are gonna start growing again. Stuff does not grow there. Here's a, here's a decades and decades old abandoned area. There's a couple trees growing in here, but it's basically, you can't even walk through it, right? It's 10, 20 foot peaks, and it's, it's, just, it's a very difficult landscape to, to engage with. Um, one of the only working pieces of infrastructure is the airport and, the, and the, um, the port complex, which is a deep water port. To do that deep water port, we had to destroy some of the coral reefs so that we could bring in the big ships, right? In 2006, the primary mining ceased. And so they went on to sort of this deeper way of cutting, getting other stuff. Um, but that's not going, that, that, that's nothing close to the production of the primary production. Um, there's 12,000 people as of uh, the last big census. This is what it looks like now. So there's a little teeny tiny fringe of vegetation around the edge. And the people is where all the people live. And all this interior part is all decimated. I think it looks better in this photo. It's a, I think it's a better illustration, this angled photo. All that stuff in the middle, it ain't doing anything with, right? So they literally have hollowed out their home um, for, to trade phosphate. So this is where we are now. The phosphate is almost done. 90% of the island is devegetated and, and not really, you know, usable, livable. Um, they uh, only have about 60 species of native plants left. None are endemic. Uh, about 40% of the reef is silted in, the surrounding reef. They've squandered essentially almost all their money. All that money in the bank that was supposed to allow them to live for generations, all that kind of stuff? It, not really. It's been squandered. It was poorly managed. They invested in things like uh, Leonardo, the musical on Broadway that like lost all, you know, hundred, millions and millions of dollars. Um, the fund in 1991 in U.S. dollars had 1.3 billion. In 2002, it had 138 million. In 2011, it was down, it was empty. Um, when this was happening, 
in the in the 90s and they're they're losing stuff like well, we need to do something else what do do? banking offshore banking so they became a haven for mafiosa stuff for illegal cartel so so you could start a bank account never be there never you just pay them money so they essentially became a money laundering facility for the criminal world of the of the planet um, that lasted until after 9 11 and then when the U.S. started cracking down on financing of terrorism groups, they're like, we got to take care of this Nauru thing. So Nauru eventually shuts that down. And now they're like, how are we going to make money? Uh, I don't know. We'll start being a, a, a refugee camp for people that, um, that Australia doesn't want them to come into their country. So just like the U.S. border right now, we're sort of housing people that are claiming asylum. Like, we're going to keep you caged up. And then you, we'll go through the process of you applying for citizenship or... Or, or to get in. Same thing, you know, the Australians, you know, learn from us, right? And so they're like, okay, this is what's gonna happen. When someone comes from a foreign country and tries to get to Australian land, we're gonna intercept them with the Coast Guard and we're gonna drive them over to Nauru and put them in a de detention camp. And then they can, they can apply for political asylum or whatever. And so, so the country of Australia pays Nauru to run these detention camps for, for immigration purposes. Uh, that's, uh, that ended in 2008. It restarted a couple years ago again, um, but it's not, it's, it's, it ain't a big thing anymore. They've decided they might want to try deep sea mining and they signed a contract in 2018 that hasn't produced anything yet, but they're just like, maybe we can mine the ocean now. Um, in general, the society right now is not really supportable. Cell phones stopped working in 2003. The UN representative suddenly couldn't call the country and they, they couldn't get, I mean, they've since restored contact, but, but all kinds of problems. The only tax that's done is a tax when, when visitors come or, or, or airport, or, you know, um, uh, transit is made. As of right now, as of, as of last year, 90% of the population is unemployed. 90% are obese. They have a 40% type 2 diabetes rate, the highest rate of any country in the world. 21% um, of the population has chlamydia. 30% of the school kids are aged 13 to 15 have reported suicidal thoughts. Um, and 24, about a quarter of the young children are stunted because they're not getting adequate nutrition. Um, and, and they're essentially a ward of Australia. So if Australia wasn't kicking them money, water at times, uh, stuff like that, it, it, it just, it wouldn't be there. So uh, uh, this idea that we can just degrade the environment and then like save up some money somewhere and they'll be okay, that Nauru speaks to the folly of that, right? And this isn't to depress us, but this is to say this is a cautionary tale, right? This is a cautionary tale. Should I uh, just, you know, plow out my plow down my backyard and put in an ADU to make some rent money from some somebody else to plow down my food garden? Maybe that's not the best idea. Maybe we should have a food garden in your backyard that might help a little bit with stuff. And that that food garden is going to work every year, right? Regardless of how much rent people pay. So this notion of sustainability and and justice and all this stuff. A healthy environment is part of that. An effective conservation policy is a part of that. And these folks, unfortunately, went down a path of not, not following those, those land ethics and, uh, and are in a horrible state right now. Okay, so, woohoo! Happy talk. Okay, that, that, that hopefully is the last negative, uh, uh, dep depressing note to end on, but it's important to make sure that we understand why these conservation measures are needed why they're needed. So in summary, um, uh, we, we, the previous lecture, we talked about how um, we can degrade ecosystems. We talked about the examples of Easter Island, Mesopotamian cedar, cedar forests, and the Aleutian archipelago vegetation. Here, and in, in today, we talked about the history of conservation in the US. We talked about the central themes. Um, uh, and in, early on, in particular, what drove us was this idea of worried about how powerful we were becoming. 
really driven by this wilderness viewed, wilderness driven world, and then the importance of aesthetics. We didn't talk about that much in my history, but, but that, is a, that is an important trend here. We talked about, we contrasted the European versus the US perspectives, especially in the early formation of the conservation movement. We went, ran through these seven different eras of conservation, of the conservation era. Uh, we talked about some of the lessons and the ultimate drivers. Again, how many people, how intensively we're using resources, all that kind of stuff, right? Well, uh, from here on out, we're gonna talk about specific issues, but it's important to keep those framed in the back of our mind. And then lastly, we ended with this example of Nauru as a case study of, of just knowing that degradation is happening or might be happening, that's not enough. That's not enough. We need to take that and actually engage in effective, proactive policies, proactive conservation management to assure that we don't get to the point when our 90% of our land is gone and 40% of our reefs are dead and that kind of stuff. So that's the history of uh, the US conservation movement and that will set us up for the rest of the semester.